Hello, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Shafiq Chima. Today we will be recording uh, <clears throat> uh, this lecture for the good doctors by Dr. Shafiq Chima and the topic for today's diabetic nephropathy. The best term to be utilized for diabetic nephropathy is diabetic kidney disease. This lecture is more relevant uh, for medical students, house officers, medical officers, and especially the people who are practicing, the general practitioner or family practitioner, because this is this is more like a practical uh, approach uh, in terms of uh, diabetic nephropathy. So uh, we will be talking about what is diabetic kidney disease and what is the global burden of chronic kidney disease. Uh, how do we manage uh, diabetic kidney disease? Uh, a case-based learning approach. And what are the emerging therapies for the management of diabetic kidney disease? At the end of this uh, lecture, you will be able to manage most DKD patients and diabetes mellitus in CKD patients. And you will be able to know when and whom to refer and how and when to use newer therapies in diabetic kidney disease. So this is management of kidney disease in diabetics as well as diabetic kidney disease management. And what are the newer and emerging therapies, especially SGLT2 receptor antagonists? So what is diabetic kidney disease? <clears throat> Before we go over to diabetic kidney disease, diabetes causes almost 40 to 50% cases of uh, chronic kidney disease. The second most common cause being hypertension and then other diseases like glomerular diseases, polycystic in kidney disease. So diabetes and hypertension two together uh, almost 70 to 80 percent cases of chronic kidney disease are caused by them. And as you know, the prevalence of diabetes is increasing. Currently, Pakistan is number three, and there are uh, almost 33 million people with diabetes. So the prevalence of diabetic kidney disease will be increasing too. So chronic kidney disease is defined as abnormalities of kidney structure and function present for more than three months with implications for health. And if these abnormalities in kidney structure and function for three months are secondary to diabetes, that would be diabetic kidney disease. And diabetic kidney disease or diabetic nephropathy usually clinically manifest in the form of protein urea or albumin urea with hypertension and progressive reduction in kidney function. That could be rise in creatinine or decrease in GFR. So this is a newer classification, CKD classification and staging. It's divided uh, based on the GFR into stage one to stage five. Stage five and GFR is less than uh, 15. Stage four is when 15 to 30. Stage three is when 30 to 60. Stage two is when 60 to 90. And if the GFR is more than 90, but there is some other abnormality, like for example, there are cysts in the kidney or patient is having protein urea, that would be stage one, meaning the GFR is normal, but there is something wrong with the kidneys and that, that's present for more than three months. And with the newer classification, the albumin urea has also been added. So if someone has normal or no albumin urea, which is less than 30 milligram per gram, that would be A1. And if someone has microalbumin urea or moderately increased albumin urea, that would be A2. And the definition would be 30 to 300 milligram per gram. And more than 300 would be macroalbumin urea. A newer definition is severely increased albumin urea. And this is the worsening uh, uh, of the chronic kidney disease based on the GFR and albumin urea. So if someone has, uh, say, only stage 3, early stage 3, but significant albumin urea, so their risk of progression of kidney disease or diabetic nephropathy uh, is very high. So they are at a very high risk category. And based on this, you could basically define from the get-go if someone is at a low risk, moderate risk, high risk, or very high risk. So people with the uh, uh, good GFR, even if they have significant albumin urea, they are at the maximum high risk, not very high risk. So this is how we try to determine the progression of kidney disease. Albumin urea has other implication. Uh, higher the albumin urea, more would be the all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, progression of kidney disease. The risk of acute kidney injury would be more if you have more albumin urea. Risk of end stage will be more. This red is uh, macroalbumin urea. So higher 
the macroalbumin urea higher would be all of these complications so albumin urea not only determine the progression of kidney disease but it increases the heart disease risk so you need to understand if someone with chronic kidney disease have albumin urea that is more significant as someone without albumin urea or protein urea so globally this is in 2010 almost 2 million people uh, had end stage renal disease uh, and they were on dialysis currently this number is 4 to 5 million so this is increasing and this is the tip of the iceberg these number of dialysis patient are only less than 0.5% of the whole ckd population which is not 10% currently it's close to 20% so in america they calculated and they thought by 2030 the prevalence of uh, chronic kidney disease would be 16% but to their surprise even in 2017 and 18 it was almost 15 16% so currently it's close to 20% so one in five or six have chronic kidney disease so it's a real burden <laughs> america has a lot of money so they are spending almost 47 billion 7% of their medicare budget we don't have that so we need to focus on early detection and prevention and early treatment so that we could delay the onset and progression of kidney disease so whenever you are managing any patient with chronic kidney disease or diabetic kidney disease you need to treat the underlying cause you need to treat the complications as a result of kidney disease and you need to risk stratify for cardiovascular disease for diabetic patients you will do early detection of kidney disease good glycemic control is important blood pressure control is important then you will treat the complications like anemia and then you will risk stratify and decrease the cardiovascular risk because the number one cause is heart disease so you will treat this lipidemias with statins lifestyle modification weight loss smoking cessation uh these are different stages of chronic kidney disease and if you see from stage 3 to stage 4 there is a significant drop from 7 8 million to maybe less than a million that is because many of these people have died of heart disease acute myocardial infarction ischemic heart disease so risk stratification is very important so <clears throat> this is i i have developed this case based learning to make it easy for the general practitioners so you could have only five scenarios in your clinical practice you could come across a new onset diabetic patient diabetes with hypertension diabetes with albumin urea or diabetes with advanced chronic kidney disease or sometime you could have diabetic but they don't have typical features of diabetic nephropathy they have some atypical features uh so say uh, you have a 50 year old male who has type 2 diabetes so the most significant thing is a uh, good glycemic control because that could decrease the risk of retinopathy nephropathy neuropathy and microalbumin urea meaning you could actually delay the onset of albumin urea and hence nephropathy uh, this is another study uk pds data showed if you decrease hba1c by 0.9% over 10 years there is a significant risk reduction for example more than 30% a risk of microalbumin urea or moderately increased albumin urea or a2 is decreased so this is very important if you come across a patient who is just diabetic good control of diabetes is important uh ke doki recommends if you decrease hba1c to 7% in both type 1 and type 2 diabetics that is important lowering below that has no potential benefit in fact you could have episodes of hypoglycemia so 7% is good enough a uh, second if you have a diabetic and you have controlled it very well you need to screen them for kidney disease because they come into high risk category high risk category is in general population if you have diabetics hypertensive people with family history age more than 60 they are at a high risk of kidney disease so they need screening and how do you screen them uh for type 1 diabetic at 5 years after the diagnosis and type 2 diabetics at the onset of diagnosis and then every year so you check their spot urine a small amount of urine for albumin and creatinine ratio and you also check their serum creatinine to calculate egfr uh by mdrd epi equation 
and then you check their blood pressure just to make sure they're not hypertensive. So diabetes alone, you control the diabetes well, you screen them for kidney disease by checking urinary albumin as well as serum creatinine and you make sure they're not hypertensive. There is no role of renin angiotensin system blockade in prevention. So just diabetics, not hypertensive, no albumin urea, no benefit of ACE inhibitor or ARB. And different studies have shown that. So situation two could be that you have a diabetic with hypertensive. Patient has hypertension also and the blood pressure is say 150 by 95. So diabetic with hypertension, no, it becomes the compelling indication to use ACE inhibitor or ARB. It's an effective first line agent. And Benedict randomized control trial have shown if you give these people ACE inhibitor and ARB, there would be less progression to albumin urea and hence diabetic nephropathy. So diabetics with hypertension, you choose ACE or ARB, either one of them. Uh, UK PDS again showed if you have a good blood pressure control, um, the reduction of more than 10 as compared to the other group, you would have a significant decrease in microvascular as well as other macrovascular complications. So blood pressure control, the current target is it has to be less than 130-80. It not only decreases the onset of albumin urea, but it will also prevent retinopathy and cardiovascular disease. There is no benefit of intensive blood pressure control as per a COD trial, especially in diabetics. Sprint did show benefit, but that was in non-diabetics. So KDCO, JNC, KDOKI recommends uh, blood pressure. So there was a little pause, but we were uh, where we were saying that blood pressure control is important and the current guideline by American Heart Association and DOKI blood pressure has to be less than 130-80 if you want to decrease the progression of kidney disease. Mm, what happened to the slide here? Give me a second. Let's go to... Let's uh, share the screen again. Okay. So the situation number three, the scenario three could be that you have a diabetic patient with hypertension who also has albumin urea. So if you have micro or macro albumin urea with hypertension, uh, that becomes a compelling indication, again, to use ACE inhibitor and ARB. And blood pressure control is the single most important factor in addition to diabetic control. And blood pressure control with ACE and ARB will also decrease albumin urea and complication of albumin urea will control the blood pressure while you are trying to control their diabetes very well. So there are different trials and uh, most of them have shown benefit of ACE and ARB. All these trials, Roadmap, IRMA, Captopril, IDNT, Renal, on target. In on target, they try to combine ACE and ARB, but there is no additional benefit. In fact, there were more uh, drug-related side effects. So no benefit of combining ACE and ARB. In fact, this is my cheat sheet <laughs> on combination. Do not combine ACE and ARB. Do not combine ARB with renin inhibitors. Titrate ACE or ARB to maximally tolerated dose. No evidence of benefit in CKD uh, stage five. Use caution in stage four or once the GFR is less than 20 because you need to make sure there is no sudden rise in creatinine or hyperkalemia. It's a drug of choice for all patients, all CKD, not just diabetic nephropathy. And 20 to 30% increase in creatinine is okay and desirable. You do not stop the drug at that. Uh, in the comprehensive care plan in diabetic with kidney disease or DKD, uh, no current recommendation is most of the patients should guess RAS blockade as well as a new drug, SGLT2 receptor inhibitors. This is very important. So we will uh, discuss that in detail. In fact, 
if someone has not achieved the HbA1c target of 7%, you will add SGLD2 receptor antagonist. But if someone has already achieved, you will lower the other drug and you will add SGLD2 receptor inhibitor because they have such a benefit in decreasing the progression of diabetic nephropathy and prevention of heart disease. So another situation could be that you have a patient with albuminuria as well as elevated creatinine, meaning they have a advanced chronic kidney disease. So this is where you refer to nephrologist because no blood pressure control is more difficult because of volume and activation of renin angiotensin system. You need to manage anemia of CKD with erythropoietin. You need to manage secondary hyperparathyroidism, metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, volume overload, risk stratify for cardiovascular complication. You need to discuss with them dialysis, transplant, peritoneal dialysis. You need to adjust insulin and maybe oral hypoglycemic agent because there is some gluconeogenesis which happens in the kidney plus insulin is being destroyed in the kidney. So there would be more insulin in the system and they could get uh, hypoglycemia. They need a lesser dose. So this is where a role of nephrologist uh, come and patient must be referred, especially if the GFR is less than 45 and they have uh, albumin urea. <clears throat> uh, we have already discussed that. Uh, there is nothing new, but it's like uh, for diabetic and kidney disease, you could use metformin as long as their GFR is more than 45. Same with SGLT2 receptor antagonist, less than 30, you cannot use. Metformin, less than 30, you cannot use. And then you have all these options. But the significant thing is, glipizide is the only drug which among sulfonyl ureas is not totally excreted by the kidney, so that is a safer drug. But there is a risk of hypoglycemia. Insulin could be used, TZDs could be used, DPP-4 inhibitors could be used, GLP-1 receptor agonists, which are... Uh, uh, <clears throat> mostly uh, insulin and there is a uh, once a week insulin available also they could be used also so once they have diabetic kidney disease with lower gfr you could use glp uh, one receptor agonist but they need some adjustment uh, some of them not all of them uh, there is a study of r7 which showed they are they are safe effective uh, like insulin, and they also decrease the CKD progression. Metformin, SGLT2 receptor, not if the GFR is less than 30. Pioglitazone can be used with GFR of less than 30, but you need to adjust the dose. Uh, no significant dose adjustment for pioglitazone, I'm sorry. Cetagliptin, you need to adjust the dose for the GFR of less than 30. They could be even used in dialysis population. Situation number five is you have type 2 diabetic and they have atypical features, uh, not typical of diabetic nephropathy. For example, they have hematuria, they have rapid progression. Normally, in the natural history, GFR falls slowly, but if there is a rapid, rapid progression, there could be a superimposed other glomerular disease. For example, in type 1 diabetes, if they have albuminuria before 5 or after 25 years, that could signify a red flag that there is something else going on. Uh, most type 1 diabetics have diabetic retinopathy preceding nephropathy. So if you have no retinopathy, that could be a red flag. Uh, evidence of another kidney disease is obvious. For example, someone has a hep C related MPGN and that's kind of obvious or biopsy proven. So then that's a, a red flag. You might need to do a biopsy. Uh, and not all the patients with diabetic uh, diabetes will develop diabetic nephropathy. Only 40% people would develop, rest would not develop. And the genetic family history is the most important factor. So in the emerging therapies, two therapies I'll talk about. One, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist phenerinone uh, or phenerinone. Uh, like spironolactone, it has shown to decrease the progression. And second, SGLT2 receptor antagonist. So there is a study published in New Zealand Journal which showed that in type 2 diabetics with the kidney disease, this mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist phenerinone will decrease the progression of diabetic nephropathy. So this could be used. The risk would be hyperkalemia, especially if you're combining with AC inhibitor or ARB. Uh, this is another study which showed a significant benefit of phenerinone. So that could be used in diabetic nephropathy, even in advanced disease. You just need to keep an eye on potassium. Uh, 
then SGLT2 receptor antagonists they block sodium and glucose, so they cause natriuresis and glycosuria. Uh, Ampar again canvas showed a benefit, cardiovascular benefit of 30 to 34 percent. Uh, then other trial, DEPA, CKD, EMPA, kidney, credence, and many other, they have showed benefit. No, the benefit is not only in diabetic kidney disease, but, but also in CKD, which are non-diabetic, in ischemic heart disease, in CHF, in IgA nephropathy. Uh, for example, this study showed canagliflozin and renal outcome in type 2 diabetic and nephropathy and showed a significant benefit in the primary outcome as well as in the secondary outcome. So the conclusion was in patient with type 2 diabetes and kidney disease, meaning diabetic kidney disease patient, canagliflozin reduces the risk of kidney failure and cardiovascular outcome. So SCLT2 receptor is a new breakthrough. You must use them unless there is a contraindication. For example, a female with recurrent UTI. So there are multiple side effects. You need to get yourself familiar with that. You might have to reduce the dose of diuretics a little bit or blood pressure medication a little bit. Because by causing natriuresis, they decrease the edema, they decrease the volume, they decrease the blood pressure also. And these are all the different trials. So it's being used even for a lower GFR. The AMPA kidney, which is still pending, uh, they have used a GFR value even lower, uh, even 15 to 29. So it would not be a contraindication anymore once the results of these trial come. Uh, obviously, the hypoglycemic effect would be less, anti-diabetic effect would be less, but still there would be benefit for kidney disease and heart disease. So this drug would be recommended even at a lower GFR in the near future. So take home message uh, from these are the best practices. CKD and diabetic kidney disease incidence and prevalence is increasing worldwide and in Pakistan because in Pakistan the diabetes is increasing, hypertension is, in, is increasing. Pakistan is number three in diabetes prevalence after China and India. So that means the risk of CKD is higher to a diabetic kidney disease. So you need to get yourself familiar with this. Cardiovascular risk reduction, decreasing the risk of heart disease, glycemic control, blood pressure control with renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system blocker like ACE, ARB and phenerinone and SGLT receptor inhibitor is the way to go. So you have four drugs, ACE, ARB, mineralocorticoid antagonist and SGLT2 receptor uh, inhibitors for diabetic nephropathy management. Consider referral to manage uh, to nephrologist once GFR is less than 30 if you're very comfortable or 45 if you're not very comfortable in management. And consider emerging therapies and keep yourself updated and utilize them unless there is a contraindication. Uh, don't use glimepiride or glycolazide. Use glipizide once GFR is less than 45. Use eGFR equation uh, and use CKD EPI, not MDRD, not Cockroft Gold, rather than uh, previous equation and rather than serum creatinine. Do urinary albumin creatinine ratio, preferably AM sample, rather urine microalbumin only because that will not give you the exact quantity. 24-hour urine collection for protein albumin uh, is incomplete without creatinine because you won't know if the sample is collected uh, inadequately or over collected. So whenever you order 24-hour urine, order creatinine with that also. That will tell you the best if the sample collection was adequate or not. If creatinine increases with RAS and SGLT2 receptor inhibitors because both could cause a hemodynamic effect, rise in creatinine, we need to explain to the patient that this is beneficial in the long term. You could reduce the drug, you could reduce the diuretic, but don't stop right away. Reduce the drug, wait a few weeks, check it again. If it stabilizes, continue getting the benefit out of it. Uh, that was it. There was a little uh, hiccup in between. Uh, I hope the, the quality was okay. Uh, please do give me feedback. This was more focused on GPs uh, and the practicing physician, but medical students would benefit out of it. And I'll keep on uploading uh, more uh, videos on different uh, topics. And I'm going to involve other physicians as well for different topics in the area of their expertise. So thank you very much. I hope it went fine.
And this was from uh, Good Doctors by Dr. Shweek Chima.